Welcome to a financial planning podcast with a down-to-earth vibe. Sasquatch would ride with you on a bicycle built for two. This is Through the Pines. Our financial wizards this week include Rex Baxter, Brandon Smith, and Dan Nelson. And then we are joined by, do we just call you uh, estate planning wizard, Bryce? Bryce Froer? Just just guru. 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 All right. Very good. So this is, we're going to call this sort of a part two on the estate planning and trusts and following up with what we didn't actually get to on part one. And maybe we'll start with some of the types of trusts that we didn't get to, Bryce. I think you had a list going there. So uh, maybe there were some we missed. How are we looking? Sure. So I think we ended the last um, session talking about revocable and irrevocable trusts. Again, the revocable is something that can be changed and, and amended um, as things change in your life. Irrevocable is exactly what it sounds like. You cannot change it. And those are very, they're not anywhere near as common as the revocable trust. When we, when we create a, an estate plan for a client, it's probably 95% of the time that revocable family trust where it, it changes with the changes that are in their lives. We can change the trustee. We can change the beneficiary. We can change assets. If they buy a house in St. George or if they, if they buy a cabin in, in uh, the Tetons or a condo, in California, we can add that into the trust and, and keep it um, up to date without having to redo it over and over and over again. Other ones that we, uh, other trusts that we occasionally work with are <clears throat> um, special needs trusts, uh, bypass trusts, or AB trusts, some people call them, um, and then asset protection trusts. Uh, I'll talk about uh, a, a bypass trust for just a few minutes. When, when I first started practicing um, back in, in the 90s, uh, and I guess I'll explain it this way, today everybody can be worth $11.5 million before they have to pay, their, their estate has to pay a death tax or an estate tax. Uh, and, and when I started back in the 90s, that figure, that $11.5 million was just about $300,000. And so <clears throat> to take advantage of as much of that benefit or that unified credit is what it's called, we would create a bypass trust. For example, if, if Rex and Jenny came into my office in the 90s and, and they had a big farm or they had a cabin in the woods and a condo on the beach in their house, we would have created a bypass trust so that they could take advantage of two of those unified credits, one for one for Rex and one for Jenny. <clears throat> we don't do those as often anymore, except for the the very wealthy. Um, and, and again, wealthy being any any couple that's worth nearly or just over eleven and a half million dollars. And we do them occasionally because there are there are people that, that we help that do have a lot of money. But the most common, uh, the common couple, the common resident of Weber and Davis County, um, they don't have that kind of cash or that kind of asset base unless they have huge life insurance policies. But, but that's why we create those bypass trusts is to take advantage of and protect as much uh, of their assets from, from being taxed by the government as we possibly can. And when I say taxed by the government, <clears throat> anything so Brandon, if you if you have fifteen million dollars, for example, and you die, true um, true statement. Yeah, well, I, I thought so. <laughs> um, your your estate could protect eleven and a half million dollars, but the other three and a half million dollars, which exceeds that that benefit protection, would be taxed at forty percent. So one point two one point what is that Rex? You're the you're the numbers guy. One point five million dollars. Too Good much is the legal it's too much. Term, the technical term. Also, Bryce, were wasn't there some legislation that was trying to take nearly all of that or something? The the death tax or whatever. Like, how did that? What was that? Yeah. So so again, this is a congressional driven law. Um, and as I stated a few minutes ago, when I first started in the nineties, it was three, four, five hundred thousand dollars. In early two thousand, that number was a million mid to mid 2000 2010 it was it was 10 million and now 
it's 11 and a half million. Uh, and so that's governed by our, our, our Congress. They set that figure. Um, and, and there is uh, some talk right now, there's some rumors that in 2025, there will be a change. Right now, what we have is set to expire in, in 2024. And uh, nobody knows exactly what will happen. I think that'll be kind of a measurement of the, the political temperature and, and, and what's going on with a lot of other things. And so I won't speculate, but, but there is some talk that that will change. And that's, that's another good reason to have an attorney, whether it's us or somebody else, that can stay on top of those numbers for you if, if you create a, an estate plan and, and you do have a, a lot of wealth that you want to protect. Right. So, yeah, I just want to make sure that, um, so what you're saying is that uh, if you set up a trust, then you can maybe determine where that goes rather than uh, just handing it over to the government. Yeah. Well, again, you can protect right now, as I said, that $11.5 million, you and your mm -hmm. wife each could protect that much. Um, and, and doing other planning, gifting, those kinds of things are certainly options that, that should be considered if, if you're one of those who does have a lot of wealth. Um, so that, that's, that's, again, when we talk about an AB, AB trust or a bypass trust, that's what we're referring to. I'll, I'll switch now to a, <clears throat> to a special needs trust. Uh, and, and those are done infrequently as well. We, we have done a fair number of them. We do them when we have a client who has a disabled son or daughter or a client who has a disabled parent and that they want to set aside a significant amount of money to provide for their care so that that son or daughter or, or, or disabled parent doesn't lose their government benefits as a result of, of having um, assets uh, available to them through a trust. So, so for example, if 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 one of Rex's children uh, were in an accident and uh, needed 24-hour a day care, Rex could set up a special needs trust for that child, and that money would be used only for the benefit of that child and would not disqualify that child from Social Security or other governmental benefits that that child might be entitled to as a result of the disability. Those are really helpful and, and protect assets for those of our community who are disabled, who happen to have parents or children who are able to um, set aside a, a pile of money or a, an income producing asset for their benefit. So, so Bryce, just really quick on, on the special needs trust, when, when is the right time for somebody to set those up as far as to have them funded and, and actually get a tax ID number for it and, and have them established. I, I see, uh, you know, sometimes I'm seeing things where they get set up and there's nothing in them um, and they just sit there dormant and dormant and dormant for, you know, 10 years, 20 years. And then all of a sudden, you know, a life event happens, parents pass or, or something like that, and then the assets flow into that. But, but what's your opinions on on when they should be established and set up and and actually created, as opposed to um, designed and and kind of the pre work done? I, I think the, it's a good question. I think my answer to a client would be uh, at the point in time when your child, your disabled child, is over eighteen. If you have the assets with which to do that, to set those aside uh, for the benefit of the child, not only is it helpful to the child, but it also reduces your taxable income um, that's, that would be included in your estate. So uh, it's, and I think Dan mentioned a few minutes ago, the funding aspect of it. That's, <clears throat> again, one of those issues that we, we sometimes struggle getting clients to follow through with is, is funding and setting aside the money, not only for a special needs trust, but also funding your individual revocable trust. And I don't know if you guys want to comment on that for a minute, and then I can share some stuff. Yeah, we, we were supposed to talk about funding in the last podcast. So let's, I, I didn't realize that you could have a trust, but you actually need to put stuff in it. So I think there's a number of people that 
uh, go to the, we, through conversations or experience, life experiences, we go to uh, the point of getting a trust and getting the documents all together, meeting with an estate attorney, working through all that, get everything back, get everything signed, and then they take a breath and they say, okay, I got that taken care of, but they neglect or forget to go in and put their home, their accounts, their all of their assets, for the most part, in that trust, which is funding it and uh, uh, partially funding it. And um, that happens a lot, I believe. And then they wait five or 10 years and they forgot that they even set up a trust and all their assets are there and something happens in life and they're not protected. Yeah. And can you double trust? Like if someone forgot, like Dan said, and then they find another attorney years down the line, I mean, where is this filed and how does that work? Yeah, that, that's an interesting question as well. Um, when, so, so I'm going to talk about funding and then I'll, I'll answer your question, Brandon. On funding, uh, when we create the trust, um, we will help our clients uh, put any real estate that they have into the trust because we can create the deed and get the deed recorded. But in terms of bank accounts or life insurance benefits, the best we can do is help them with with forms because the banks won't talk to us. In fact, um, Ameriprise, unless the client authorizes me, I can't even tell you that I've 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 created a trust for a client. I have to get permission from that client to say, hey, please talk to Rex or Brandon or, or, or Dan and let them know I've done this so that they can. Um, move my account to have it owned by my trust or transferred to my trust on my death. Um, it's, it's very common. Uh, we'll, we'll create a trust or somebody will come into our office and say, Hey, my, my mom and dad have this trust and, and, and their house isn't in the trust. What do we do? And so then, and we didn't talk about this in the last session, but then we have to use the pour over will. We probate that, that house, to get it into the trust. And unfortunately that costs money and time, but if we've done it right in the first place, we, we can avoid. So funding is is a big issue that, that we deal with quite a bit, um, making sure, trying to make sure that our clients have the necessary documents, have the necessary information to properly put the assets that they have into the trust so that when that day does come first, their successor trustee has control over them for their benefit. And second, the successor trustee has the ability to distribute the assets according to what, what's outlined in the trust. Mm. Rex. Yeah, I think, I think funding and titling are probably one of the, the biggest issues. Um, you know, it, it tends to happen and, and pop up almost every week uh, for, for us with, with clients to where, or, or new clients to where something comes in this this last week we we're dealing with somebody and they they had participated in what's called a an in, in, an employee stock purchase plan or an espp to where essentially they're working for a company and through payroll deduction they're buying stock in that company um at, at a discounted price and and because they're buying it through the company it gets purchased in their individual name typically and so that goes on for years and it's typically held at a, a what we call a transfer agent, not necessarily in a normal brokerage account. Um, and so it just kind of sits over there and it's and it's not titled in their trust and, and it's not held with most of their assets. And so then all of a sudden when we start compiling their their financial plan and and at the last second, they're like, oh, yeah, I forgot I have this. And so then then we go through it. And, and next thing we know. You know, it's an individual name, not even joint name, um, and lots of times not even a beneficiary or anything on it. And so it creates a, a real conundrum, if you will, conundrum. Um, yeah. <laughs> about, about, you know, what would happen if they passed away. Um, we also find that a lot with real estate, um, that lots of times, you know, one of the one of the spouses is involved in rental properties or involved in in land. And, and they're doing all these deals either in their own name, in the single name, because it's easier to sign and transact business, or they're doing it in a business name. And, and it's not linked back to their estate plan. It's not linked back. 
as to who owns, you know, the, the LLC or, or something like that. And so all of that ends up going back through probate, ends up going through the pour over will. Um, and, and that, that is a process and it takes time. And, and lots of times the family is, is trying to get things transferred or passed on, or there may be even be estate tax issues where they're having to raise money within nine months of when somebody passes away. And, and then we've got to get into liquidation at the same time we're dealing with courts and it, it really turns into a mess. Well, Rex, I see why you, you work with an estate planner and attorney here. So like explain when you're talking to clients again, Rex Baxter, plan with Baxter.com. You can, you can chat with Rex, get a hold of Rex. Like when you're putting a financial plan together, how often, you know, do you run into someone doesn't have a trust or has a trust or needs a trust? And when does that, when is that conversation? Is that early on in the financial planning? Does it depend on how much they have or like, how does that work? So, so for our team, you know, as we're going through and, and bringing on new clients, things, things along that line, um, we, we attack that really quick. It's really mm -hmm. high on the priority list for us. Um, you know, we're looking at, at beneficiaries and titling are two of the first things that we're looking at with clients. And, and if they don't have a trust, then we're having that discussion as to, you know, why don't you have a trust? Is there a reason, um, you know, how important is it to you? And we'll run through different examples and, and then we'll try and loop in, you know, some, somebody like Bryce. And, and typically we try and be in those meetings with Bryce, um, if at all possible, just for, for a number of reasons. One, it's, you know, more heads are better than one. And, and lots of times, we have a fairly good feel for, for the clients, their families, uh, where they're headed, that, that sometimes they may be hesitant to, to bring up or, or not really think to bring up with Bryce to where it's easy for us to kind of steer that conversation and make sure that everything is disclosed the way it needs to be for Bryce to do a good comprehensive job. Um, but the worst thing can happen is somebody, you know, keeps certain things from them and and then we've done a half job that just creates more problems than than it's worth so so really early on is is when we attack that if we can okay brandon smith you have a comment yeah i was just gonna say we're, i mean we're never gonna strong arm someone into a trust right we're no. not <laughs> we're not like but but I, I oftentimes what you find is people just don't know right they they, they don't know what a trust is why it's the pros and cons of each and, and to be able to really walk someone through why you would want to have a trust, typically as people see th those things, right, then it becomes a priority usually. Um, not that all priorities get accomplished right away, <laughs> right? But, but, but it is something that we like to review with them. And, and even year after year as, as we're meeting to, to just kind of touch on that and say, hey, you know, we still don't have that trust in place. Do we want to get that? And, and, and so it's not something we're forcing people to do, but but it is usually as, as people understand what they are, they become a lot more um, open to it. Okay. Bryce, let's go back to, you know, have you seen, a, how do you, where is this filed? Can you double trust or whatever? How does that work? And then what can go in trust? Uh, farms, LLCs, S Corps. What about nonprofits? Can you throw that into some sort of a trust? Uh, <clears throat> I, I've never had anybody that owns or, or is involved in a nonprofit put that into a trust, but there's no reason you couldn't. Mm. Um, yeah, to answer your question, I was going to come back to, can you have more than one trust? And I'll give you the example. Um, uh, November, last year in November, I had a client come in that he owned, <clears throat> he owned his home, had some money in the bank, had uh, some investment property and some recreational property. And he wanted to treat the rec recreational property differently than the investment property and those differently than his house. And so we ended up creating three different trusts for him because he wanted those, <clears throat> when that day comes that he passes away, he wanted those distributed differently. One of them he wanted to, to remain, uh, that, that property was to remain in the trust for a period of time after his death for the benefit of his children to use it for their recreation. And so, uh, yeah, you can have multiple trusts. <clears throat> that can become a problem if 
if when you have your trust created, you don't designate the date of the trust. And so when, for example, when we create a trust for a family, for, for a couple, we'll say, all right, we're transferring your, your property into the, to the Brandon Long Trust dated February 2nd, 2022, because last week, Brandon did another trust in January, on January 28th, and he put something else in that trust. And so we distinguish the assets that are in the, in the particular trust we're talking about. <clears throat> I'm just trying to get you paid, Bryce. I just, I'll do a, a trust a week if you want. Yeah. That, that, that works. <laughs> <laughs> we would probably start questioning your, uh, <laughs> my your, motives. Your, your <laughs> sanity. Yeah. <laughs> that too. <laughs> yeah. There's the word. Um, so, so you mentioned LLCs and corporations and Rex had also mentioned that as part of the trust. <clears throat> Yeah, we want those those business interests owned by the trust because primarily, again, if you become incapacitated, your successor trustee can then manage those assets, that LLC or that that stock for your benefit or the account at Ameriprise for your benefit. And and the trust, as you pass away, can then designate who gets that. I have a lot of clients who, who have a small business <clears throat> And, and they work with a son or a daughter and they, they'll say, look, this business, I want to go to that child who's been working there with me. And so we don't treat it like we would a, a, a bank account of $10,000 where everybody gets their share. We would say this particular child who's been working with dad or with mom is going to get that business interest for their, for, for part of their, as part of their share. It's really quite easy to do that. We don't have to have the the stock certificate uh, in the name of the trust, we can, but we generally don't. We just make an assignment. It's a document <clears throat> where we say, as for my 30% interest in Brandon Long LLC, I want that in my trust. We sign it, date it, that takes care of it. Um, what it, that, it that does have that. a nice ring to it, so I think we should probably make that happen. We create one of those for you? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, I like that. Easy yeah. to do. Easy. <laughs> Did we talk about funding enough? Do we should we cover more of of how to fund it um, or making sure it's funded? I think I think we have talked. The, the issue again. Uh, well, I'll, I'll say this: sure. that that that's one of the issues that comes up that ends up causing the need to probate an estate is because we have not properly funded the trust. Whether it's a bank account or a piece of real estate, those are the two things that we often see. And I don't know, Rex, that's probably your experience as well, but but those are the two assets that if we don't get them named as either owner of the trust or beneficiary to the trust, those create probate, probate uh, court problems for us. And just to clarify, Bryce, so funding doesn't mean you're putting money into a trust. It means you're designating an asset into the trust. So, so, so for example, Rex, I'll let you hit that one. Yeah, let, let's just define what funding means, right? Yeah. You're just changing. It, it actually is fairly simple. You're just changing title. And so instead of something owned by Brandon Long, um, such as the house, we're going to we're going to go down record a deed and now it's going to be titled you know owned by the Brandon Long Trust and and then that house is now funded the trust it's now in the trust same with the brokerage account instead of a, a Brandon Long brokerage account it's now going to be the Brandon Long Family Trust brokerage account with Brandon yeah. Long as trustee and now it's funded and so when we talk about titling and funding, we're saying that you need to change the title from individual name or joint name into the name of the trust is what needs to happen. Um, and and it's, it's really as fairly simple as that. Some of the most common things I see are certainly bank accounts and brokerage accounts. And, and I actually see a lot of real estate too. And for some reason, a, a lot of attorneys out there um, don't prepare the deeds and don't do the transfer of title on the real estate. Um, they'll, they'll generate the trust, they'll give the client a list of things to do on page you know, 97 of, of, a, of a big long book and, and the client forgets about it and then doesn't change any of the ownership. Yeah, no. So they paid all this money 
and nothing happened. No, that's super interesting, Bryce. So how does so? We'll just walk through the process real quick. So we we come see you, and uh, you know, I can just imagine an attorney filling out filling out all the paperwork, and it's like, here is your trust, Mister Long, and then you take it home, and you're like, I'm I'm done. I don't have to do anything. But, uh, oh, yeah, there's some stuff on page eight you should probably take care of. Like, how do you follow up on that to make sure it gets funded? Who? I'm, I'm sure that happens in your industry. I mean, but I don't all, all know. The time. Yeah, yeah, all the time. So, so I'll use real estate as, as an example. When, when we create a trust for Brandon Long, we will create the deed to Brandon Long's house, and we will record that deed unless there's a really good reason not to. And there's usually not a good reason not mm. to record the deed. So we help fund that trust. We also provide, um, we'll sit down with the client with regard to, for example, life insurance policies. We'll help them get the change of beneficiary form from the life insurance company and sit down with them and complete that form so that 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 can be mailed to the life insurance company. And when, when that event, that death happens, the benefits will be paid to the trust so that, that that's taken care of. Bank accounts are a little more interesting in that, that we can we can name the trust as the owner or we can name the trust payable on death. And I find that that's more what people like to do. And what that means is if I have a bank account at, at America First Credit Union and I indicate in, on my account there that I want it to be payable on death to my trust, when I die, my son's can take my death certificate to, to America First Credit Union and they will say, oh, Bryce listed this account as payable on death to the Bryce Floor Trust. It will now pay those benefits or those assets to them as trustees. Um, Rex, how, how do you handle Ameriprise with, with the funding um, process? Yeah, so we, we, we handle it very similarly, right? As if um, we, we like to title it into the name of the trust instead of payable on on death or transfer on death to the trust. Just because the problem with, with payable on death or transfer on death is is when is if you get become incapacitated, is then it's not titled in the trust. And so it, then you've got to go back and rely on the power of attorney. A lot of financial institutions prefer, even though they'll they'll with a fair amount of red tape, they'll recognize an outside power of attorney, but they really prefer their own power of attorney paperwork, most financial institutions. And and most people don't do that. They think, oh, I've already got the power of attorney with Bryce. Um, I don't need to do yours. And and although technically that's probably true, it just takes longer um, to get it through the red tape of the different financial institutions. And so because of that, we, we feel fairly strongly that we want it titled into the name of the trust. Um, Rex, you know. can I ask another question, Brandon? Sorry, I, I, I always struggle uh, with with four hundred one k IRA type assets. Do do you recommend those be the beneficiaries of those be the trust, or should they be the spouse or the children? So, so that's always a great question, and and we get that a lot. Um, and and it's it's interesting because different different attorneys have fairly strong opinions one way or the other right. on, on beneficiaries. Um, you know, generally speaking, there, there was a law change here, what, a year ago, Brandon, probably, probably something like that um, with the SECURE Act to where, he, you know, if it's individual beneficiaries on a retirement account, non-spouse, so it's going to kids um, or somebody else, then you have up to 10 years to withdraw the funds from that retirement account. Whereas if it's a trust, you have five years to distribute it from from a retirement account. And so you can imagine if you have a you know a million dollars in, in a 401k plan or $2 million or something like that in an IRA, um, having to pull it out over five years versus 10 years can jump you up a tax bracket or two. And so, and so we prefer to have the individuals listed. That being said, there there are certainly a, a fair amount of situations where we prefer to have the trust. If we have a spend you know a spend happy child in the family, um, then we like it to be controlled by the trust. If we're or dealing with a child who has a, a, an addiction or something like that, right? A, any of those things, an, an addiction or or their special needs, 
right? Then we want to make sure that the trust is the beneficiary. And so there's a number of situations that, that we could list off where we do want the trust. So, it, so it's not a blanket answer right. as to it should always be X. Um, Brand, Brandon Long, what's our favorite answer that, that you absolutely love? Hashtag, it depends. <laughs> it depends. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, so it depends on the, on the situation as to, as to what we're going to put. So. Brandon, jump in here. Yeah, I was just going to say, th- this, is, this is the beauty of, and, and, and really the genius of a trust, is I don't own my own home, right? Like it's, it's literally not titled in my name. It's titled in the name of my trust. And so if I want to make a change to my home or, or do something, right, that I legally need to do with it, sell it, whatever that is, I can do that because I am a trustee on that trust, right? I have legal authority myself and my wife have legal authority to do it. But do I own it? No, I don't. The trust does. And so if I die and I own something, the courts are going to have to re- redistribute it. If I die and my trust owns it, my trust still still stands, right? And so then, then you go to who are the trustees? Who can make decisions? Well, he's died and she's died. Who's left? Well, he put contingent, you know, successor trustees that can then make decisions. And so my home is never, it's never in question who's going to own it next because the trust owns it. And I've appointed people who can make decisions based on, on, on the ownership, based on the trust. Same thing with my, you know, my non-qualified investment account. If I die, I, I don't own it, right? It's, it's not mine, it's my trusts, but I am the one who is appointed because I appointed myself, <laughs> no conflict of interest, just kidding. I appointed myself <laughs> to make all the decisions on that, on that trust. If myself and my wife have passed away, then I've appointed someone else who can make those decisions. So no judge ever has to go and look at my look at my stuff and look at how I've put everything and say, I think so and so should be in charge and sign off on it. I've already designated, I've already put it in an entity that is self-standing, self-existing. And I've put in my list of people who I want to have take control of that, you know, if I'm not here. And and I think that in a nutshell is what a trust is all about. Okay, so I recently heard that um, if you if you really want to reach a goal, you have to look at the negative. It's like reverse psychology. So if you this is how it was explained, if you want to lose weight, for instance, you have to um, imagine yourself six months from now without a pound lost. Would you be happy? And that is more of a motivator than if you're looking at like chiseled bodies um, that you want to have, because if you can imagine the worst case scenario, you're more likely to act. So Bryce, if I have a home with my wife and I do not have a trust, how bad does it get? Where And I die, we both die somehow, and I, we've got kids. What happens to the home? How bad does it get? So that's a good question. So using your example, if, if your home is owned, owned by you and your wife and you have children and you both die, somebody would have to be designated as your personal representative through the probate process through court. And then that person would have to, um, if you have minor children, they would hold on to those assets until your children turned 18, at which time your children would receive their share of whatever you have. And, and that, that should be enough to scare people to say, Hey, I don't want my 18 year old son to get anything because they'll go out and buy a car. And, and how does the court decide who that person is until the kids are old enough? So, so if you've created just a simple will, you designate who that is. Mm. If you haven't done any planning, somebody has to say, Oh, I'll do it. I'll do it for Brandon. Mm. He, he's died. He's my brother. He's my friend. He owes me money. I'll do it. I'll, I'll, I'll take care of that. Um, that's not a pleasant experience. Uh, because you don't, you don't have, you, you haven't done anything to control. Yeah. I have no control in charge. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, Bryce. so what carry, carry that through Bryce for a second. Let's say, let's say Brandon passes. Let's say he has three kids. Um, he died in test date, meaning without a will or a trust or anything else. And, and he's got this house kids turn 18. And so my guess is that they would each own one third of the property in tenants in common probably wait they all turn 18 Um, at the same time or how does that work well yeah so so they don't so let's say that they turn 18 over a year so one gets on there but then the the personal representative starts to protect it for the other two 
So when the last one turns 18, all three are on the house. And let's say middle child wants his money. How does that work? So, um, <laughs> that's a good question. <laughs> I think that the, the house probably would be sold to take care of the children and that money would just sit in an account. And as they turn 18, they would get their third. Um, in the event that they, they did, uh, let's say they were all over 18 when Brandon and his wife passed away, then yeah, they would all be a one third owner as tenants in common of that house. And if one of them wanted their share, they would have to go to court and, and ask the judge to force a sale. Uh, in, in, that, in that scenario, the court probably, be, probably would say, yeah, we're not going to have this just sitting, sell that asset so that you three can do with what you want, your shares. Yeah, and interesting. So, I mean, it really does get messy yeah. um, in, in those kinds of situations if you don't have, a, you know, a, at least a will, certainly, but, but probably a will and a trust. So it's... Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, no. Okay, should we bump forward? Are we ready to move into? Yeah, so so Brandon, let's talk yeah. about um, asset protection trust, Medicare, Medicaid for a minute. Okay. Um, occasionally, three or four times a year, I'll have uh, an older client come in with a son or a daughter and say, you know what, I, I'm afraid that I'm going to end up in a care facility and so I want to I want to transfer my house to my son or my daughter uh, so that they get something, so that they inherit something. And um, <clears throat> to me, that's a little bit dangerous on the part of the, the 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 senior client, the elderly client, the mother or the father, because again, they they lose control of the house, uh, they lose control of that asset, and so. An alternative to that is an asset protection trust uh, where we would transfer that property into, for example, we would call it the Brandon Long Asset Protection Trust with Brandon as the grantor and Rex as the trustee. And, and Brandon would be the beneficiary, but, but Rex would control the asset. Uh, and hypothetically, if Brandon ended up disabled and needed to go into a care facility, if we've transferred that asset five years before, Rex would not have to use that asset for his care. Uh, we would be able to protect that asset for the beneficiaries designated in the trust. Um, Social Security is a, well, I'll, I'll be more specific. There's Medicare and there's Medicaid, right? So everybody, as we turn 62, 65, we're entitled to to be on Medicare, that's the government insurance plan for our elderly and our our very young and and um, and and what very very poor. Medicaid, on the other hand, is the government plan for long term care, meaning that if you don't have any assets and you can't take care of yourself because you're mentally disabled or you've got Alzheimer's or dementia or um, you're just not capable of providing for your care, the government will allow you to go into a care facility and cover those expenses for you. That's part of our, part of what we pay taxes for. A lot of people, not a lot, some people want to avoid having to pay that cost out of their pockets for their long-term care because it's expensive. Um, Rex, what's the, what's the typical cost for a month at a, at a care facility that so, so in Utah right now, it's about five thousand dollars for a basic cost, and then if you're needing skilled nursing and things like that, then it's on top of that. And so I've seen it typically range anywhere from from five thousand to to maybe eight in the state of Utah, somewhere in that range. Yeah, per so month. Per month. Yeah, per yeah. per month. Per so month. You can blow through a, a small savings account pretty quickly. So, so I'll give you the kind of the example that we 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 do, and it's usually a house. Clients will come in and say, you know what, I want to put this in an asset protection trust so that if I do end up in a, in a care facility, Medicaid will cover that cost and my kids will end up with something. Um, the kicker or the, or the caveat there is that 
we have to do that. If, if, if Brandon, if, if you came into me and said, I want to create an asset protection trust in 2022, you have to live till 2027 before you can go into that care facility because Medicaid has a five year look back to say, hey, if you transferred anything out of your out of your control in the last five years, we're going to go grab that and use that for your care. So they're not super common, but they are they are used occasionally. Yeah, uh, Bryce, this is might be this is a little. I just I'm just curious. I want to know how you stay on top of all of this. It seems like there's a lot, and then uh, laws change, and you know different things change. How do you stay in the game? I know this is your job it's what you do but you're if you're busy working with clients on the side where do you find the time to like stay up on all the things it, well and, and and i guess i say we there in, in our office there's five of us and and um we all try to bounce ideas and and bounce different scenarios off of each other to try and keep up on it we also as attorneys uh, we're obligated to to um keep up to date on, on, in the areas of practice that we work in. And, and we call the, the continuing legal education is what it's called. We're, we're all attorneys are supposed to complete 24 hours of continuing legal education every two years. And so when I, when I have to take one of those CLE classes, I usually focus on the state planning or on family law so that I can stay up on these kinds of questions. And, and, and I don't profess to be, um, an expert on all of the trusts. I mean, we, we talk about the, the T crats and the grats and the crats and the clats and the, the, uh, it's like a Dr. Seuss book. Right. Yeah. Right. And, and, and yes, those, those are, are, uh, options. Um, and we've done some of that, but, but rarely, uh, do we do those kinds of trusts because those kinds of trusts, they're all typically done with the ultra wealthy, who want a tax deduction, so they so they set aside money for a, a charity that's that's paid through a trust, and they get a tax de- deduction, or uh, something like that. And and so if I had a client come in and say, "Hey, I've got these many millions of dollars, and what can we do about it?" Um, we know enough people who do work in those areas. Uh, we would bring them in to help us out. The other thing I'll say about your question is. It's a lot like taxes. I know enough to know that I don't know enough. And so when I have a tax question, I'm going to go to a CPA. And, and when I have a, an investment question, I don't know enough about that. That's why I use Rex and his team because they have those answers. And, and, and Rex is great to, if I have a client that's got money that he doesn't know or she doesn't know what to do with it, I say, look, let me have you talk to Rex or one of the members of his team because they're low pressure and they're going to help you and give you options. And and help you feel like you're part of what you're doing here instead of saying, this is exactly what you need and this is why we're gonna put it there for you. They, they let them, Rex lets them be part of the discussion. Yeah, I feel bad for my CPA. It's like getting a master's degree every year because they change so many laws. Uh, Brandon, do you have some more numbers? You bet. I know. So uh, this is kind of interesting. In <laughs> December, <laughs> December 31st, 2018, about okay. three years ago, yeah. um, there were 1.53 million homes for sale in our nation. Three. That's not a lot. 1.53 million homes for the entire nation um, three years ago. Yeah. That has decreased. So that it is as of November 30th, 2021. So three years later, just a couple months ago, there were only one point one one million homes available yeah. according to the national association of realtors it is just it's crazy how thin the housing market well i saw getting. utah was up like 33 percent, and we're per, pretty much leading the nation right now i don't know if that was a true number but it's high and then also i saw a pretty funny meme where um if i don't know if you've ever cooked spinach but there was like the non-cooked spinach and the cooked spinach where it's like shrunk down and the the non-cooked spinach was all the people looking for a house and the cooked spinach where it's like nothing where the house is available on the market like there's just nothing there's nothing there so it's it's super competitive right now um so when you get your house interesting number though to go from i mean down down 30 percent 
in inventory over the last three years when even in 2018, you know, 1.5 million houses for sale across the entire United States is is historically extremely thin, extremely low. Yeah. And so we've just gone through from from low to to you know ultra thin. You we know? Need so. Ultra thin. We need we need builders. We need the, the builders got to get on their game because there's just not enough out there right now. Um, yeah. Soup. That's thanks, Brandon. Appreciate that. You bet. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I so. Bryce, do you want to get into any of these T Kratz G Rat Krat Clat Oh my stuff? I don't know what what is this stuff. Um, He's all no, no, no. <laughs> I can tell you, a charitable remainder trust. It's a it's a trust that again, if people want to leave a, uh, an asset to a charity and get a tax deduction, it's an option that they can use. Uh, same with a clat, a, a charitable lead annuity trust. A CRAD is a charitable remainder annuity trust. Um, they're, they're all different trusts that are not used frequently, Yeah. Uh, that are used for um, charitable benefits, uh, donations to universities, donations to hospitals, those kinds of things. I don't know, Rex, do you ever use those kinds of things with... with Ameriprise, you ever see that? So we used to use we used to use some of them a lot more uh, before some of the tax law changes, like the the grant to retained annuity trust or the grats, um, because we could discount real estate um, and different things as we would kind of put them in, and so we could kind of peg a price in real estate, put it in gift real estate at lower values. Um, to kids and and therefore kind of expedite the passing of assets between generations. And so we used to be able to do a lot more of those um, here about 10 years ago, but the, some of the, some of the laws have kind of cracked down on some of those things, but, but with, you know, some of our, our wealthier clients, we certainly still see some of those things, especially those that are charitably inclined. And so, you know, whether it's, you know, some, sometimes, People want to make sure that their their charity gets their money first, and then you know the the kids get their money second. And there's ways to avoid taxes, estate taxes. So if you have a you know an estate that's you know 30 million or or you know 40 million or something like that, and we're trying to avoid that 40 percent estate tax, then then we can sometimes do a, a charitable lead or a charitable remainder annuity trust that's that's testamentary and we can zero out the tax um, impact of that by by giving that gift to charity over time and then everything that's remaining in that trust because we had that tax deduction passes on to to your heirs and so the, these are certainly complex um, and and fairly fairly rare techniques that we use with our wealthiest clients. But but we have actually between Bryce's group, between the Ameriprise, uh, we, we have a, a specialized financial planning group made up with with attorneys as well. And and then obviously that's that's one of our strengths for our team is estate planning as well, I would say. Um, and so when you put all of our heads together, generally we can come up with fairly good solutions um, up and down the asset ladder of wherever your your family is at, whether we're looking at a regular family revocable trust, all the way up to the most complex trusts that that are out there. Dan, jump in on here. When I, I know I've seen this over the years, it, it usually does have some characteristics of a per, of a certain type of a client. It's usually the ultra wealthy, first of all. It usually is a combined family, uh, could be second or a third marriage, kids from different places kids in different stages of life uh, all the way from really having a hard time with life to very wealthy and successful uh, and it usually uh, oftentimes it has to do with a lot of real estate uh, and it has to do with the current estate laws and what the number is uh, at, a, at a certain point in time like like Bryce said back in the 80s it was a very small number now 11 million but if you've got a 40 or 50 million dollar estate uh, and you have uh, a certain charity or two or three charities that you care a great deal about and i've seen situations where some people care a great deal about those charities much more than they do some of their kids unfortunately uh, 
those those come into play and uh, people do use certain types of trust to reduce the uh, reduce the estate tax interesting all right price uh thanks so much you're it was a pleasure having you on. I, I loved all this information. What did we miss in two hours, if you didn't catch the first episode, two hours of trust and estate planning, and I feel like we could actually go another hour. But that's we have to cut it off. We have to end it at some point. So, Bryce, what did, what did we not cover? Anything? I guess I would say, and, and, and I'll ask Rex to weigh in here too, uh, we talked about divorce, but what we didn't talk about is a blended family and 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 when when i get divorced and then i remarry what do i do about my estate planning and, and my children and her children and our children uh, and and that is one of the really nice things about a trust is we can be really specific about look when i die my kids are going to get a b and c and her kids are going to get e f and g and our kids are going to get e d h and i right we can we can fashion it such that um we don't have to exclude anybody's kids. And, and, and we do a lot of that. There's a lot of second marriages and third marriages. And, 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 and I'll ask Rex to weigh in on that as well. I, I'm sure you see that probably not weekly, but pretty often. No, but, but pl- plenty frequently. And, and when you talk about upset families and hard feelings, you know, that's, that's lots of times exponential on blended families. Um, because there's there's additional emotions and sometimes resentment that, that resides in there. And so the the more clear that you can make it, which is it, it, it's always interesting that people people still think that the trusts are just for the rich and just to avoid taxes. And and that's probably the biggest myth. If we were going to dispel one myth, that's probably the biggest myth that we need to dispel is is trusts really are. A, an amazing tool for to, to be able to spell out who gets what when um, to go back to that and and you can control that you can control the who you can control the what and you can control the when um, and and that works great with blended families it works great that you can write in you know different pieces of divorce if you need to um, you know and so there, there's just a lot of pieces that you can you can write in you know special needs trusts if you if you have you know a, a young autistic son or, or something like that um that that is high functioning now but you're not sure where they might be later um then then you can kind of write that in and you can you can spell that out with language you can protect um the assets from from being used for uh, you know if you're if you're against drug use or against different things like that then then you can write that into the trust and you can kind of control uh, you know, different things that need to be going on in order for them to have access to those funds so that you don't continue to to allow people to spiral downhill with with larger bank accounts upon that inheritance. So, they, you know, I, I, I think, you know, they're important and they're an important part of an estate plan. So, yeah, I agree. Uh, Bryce, thanks so much for your time. Appreciate it. It's a pleasure. And nice to, to work with you thank you yeah I genuinely appreciate having you all on I always learn so much every time we do these podcasts so again to get in touch with any of the fine gentlemen here we did have Bryce's information scrolling let's scroll that there it's at the bottom of the screen give him a call 801-621-2690 or hit the website up it's froreandmiles.com so you can search Bryce Froer probably on all the things and find him as well. And then Rex and Brandon and Dan Nelson is planwithbaxter.com for all of your financial needs, financial planning needs. So thanks for tuning in, everyone. This has been Through the Pines, reminding you to use yesterday's dollars to finance tomorrow's dreams. 